and welcome to the Brando and Joe podcast. Today's guest is Laura Bishop. She is currently in the PhD IO program at DePaul University, has experience in learning and development and organizational development. Welcome, Laura. How's it going today? Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, my first time on a podcast, so this is exciting. Yeah, it's been fun for us too. I think this is maybe like our sixth episode, seventh. So if we're not as great podcasters, um, maybe you can give us some tips after. <laughs> but hopefully it'll be fun. Um, how are your classes going so far in this new semester? Uh, good. So um, actually our school is on the quarter system. So I'll be done with classes in a couple of weeks right before spring break. Um, and then I'll be cl- done with classes forever. So that's pretty exciting. Oh, how was the, did it feel like it went fast? This is your, you said third year? Yeah, um, the first two years were very long because of COVID, but this last year has really flown by so far. So that's so. And then by the quarter system, it, it would be like four quarters. Yeah, we like don't four, do classes. Four yeah, we don't do classes in the summer. Um, so we just have autumn, winter, and spring quarters for classes. Okay. Sometimes I know in, I mean, so master's programs are so different, um, but the master's program my sister was in uh, for English, she had summer classes. And sometimes I wish I was like, oh, maybe summer class would be nice. Like, I know people enjoy break, but uh, in a way you kind of get it done with sooner, or I don't know if I just like the continuity of it, but I, we had long winter break too. Maybe it would have been nice to have some classes then. Our winter break lasted from like, what, middle December to end of January. Yeah, but like the thirty first of January or something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> it was like it was like a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, ours goes ours is from Thanksgiving until January first. So it's definitely oh, pretty wow. long. Oh it's, I never heard of someone's longer than a half but that's like I guess maybe on a quarter system it is a bit different. Yeah, um, and that's actually about the same distance, it's just a different time. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So as we get more into uh your your program and the courses you've taken um, for us, when we've talked to when we talked to some other students, they got to choose some of the classes they got to take. Was that the same for you? Or did you kind of have like a preset schedule and you kind of knew exactly like who was going to be in your class and like what was going to happen? Yeah. So we have, um, a few electives that we're allowed to take. So I think there's like four or five. Um, and a lot of us choose to put them towards either business school classes or um, if you're doing a concentration, like uh, I'm doing a quantitative concentration. So I do like more quant classes, um, but we do have a core set of IO classes. I think there's nine classes that you have to take uh, and that's shortened if you're doing our MS program. Um, I think it's only six then, but, um, and then we have like just two gen like psych classes that we have to do. So like um, psychology of judgment, decision-making, for example. Oh, okay. So you, you're you doing the joint master's PhD. You have a different set of requirements for that program. So it was nine versus six. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, because we have a four plus one program at DePaul um, where undergrads can do their last year of uh, undergrad as a first year grad student. And then they have one more year and then they're done. So, but otherwise we don't offer an MA or an MS um, outside of that program. So it's just a little bit different to make it easier for them. And what's the, what's the total credit load you guys take for the MS then? Um, that's a good question. I want to say, uh, we do about three classes a quarter over nine quarters. So 27. Okay. So nine, nine classes. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I want to like pull up my, my course load tracker, but um, yeah, I think something like 14 classes total. So that's about the same as us. Yeah. We're, we're we have two years, four semesters and about four classes or maybe a lab. It's four, four, and then three and three, right? Oh, that's, I actually don't know the, the amount of classes we take next year. <laughs> um, I think that would be, yeah, maybe because there wouldn't be a lab. So. Oh. Right. Well, we have four and a lab. Yeah. I just checked really quick and it's 23 classes total with 10 of them being in the IO core. 
Oh, wow. Okay, so so are a lot of those other classes, what like what do those other classes look like, I guess? Um, yeah, so we do a lot of stats. So stats one, stats two, research methods, uh, factor analysis. I'm literally reading this off <laughs> my course history list. Uh, psych measurement, um, and then electives. So I did like change management, people analytics one, uh, multivariate statistics, leadership in orgs, but in the business school instead of in IO, but we also have an, a leadership in IO. Um, and then the psychology of judgment, decision-making, and I did a women and gender class. And so for all of those classes, did you pick them or were those the ones that you had to take? And then you have the electives that you get to choose. Yeah. So we have to take stats one, stats two, measurement and research methods. Um, but the other classes I mentioned are, you get to pick. I uh, actually really awesome. like that. Like a class on people analytics um, they got to choose was super interesting. We had, we take, um, in development motivation and we, we like those classes, but sometimes I, I feel like, Oh, like there are other aspects of IO that I wish I got to learn a little bit more about in like a lecture setting. Um, cause you could always do your own research, but it is nice to have, you know, professional telling you what, what it is. <laughs> Yeah, and they actually have um, more IOs in the business school than we do in our psychology department. So it's nice to take those business school classes because they're with IOs anyway. So it's still got that IO perspective. I know you said you you wanted a more quant uh, aspect of your program. Is that what kind of drove you to choose those elective classes? Like you wanted those analytical, um, I think you, you said multivariate stats. Was that like your thought process going into it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to do the quant concentration. Um, there are other concentrations you can choose to do, like uh, a women and genders one. Um, I think you can do like a social, like just a social one in general. Um, but I just felt like the quant one would be the most useful for going applied. So. No, yeah, I definitely agree, especially in, I feel like we're seeing more and more people having to learn about different ways to use data or like different software that they have to learn um, anything along those lines. And you kind of, I mean, you, we have to take statistics in psychology, but other than that, if you have like an undergrad in psychology, we didn't really do much math. It's, there was no, I mean, at least in my undergrad, there was no, um, I guess they call them like the hard science classes they had to take. I think the most math classes we take was statistics. And then we did, we did a little bit in research methods, but nothing special. Um, I don't know if that was the same for yours and Brandon's mm -hmm. undergraduate, but that's all I really took. So it was kind of so not a surprise, but like, I was like, oh, this is actually kind of cool. I get to do more math. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, for my, my undergraduate, I, I did business school, so we had a lot of math, <laughs> but that was like a little bit different. Like for, for business school, it was like, we took calculus, we took stats and then we did like accounting and we did all of those things as well. Uh, which definitely comes in handy when starting and taking IO classes. Um, for you, Laura, what bachelor's classes did you take that really helped you for your uh, master's and PhD program? Yeah, uh, so I went to University of South Florida for undergrad, um, which I really loved because I got to be near an IO program, which was nice. Um, so they had psych stats as like a specific class as well as research methods, um, which was taught by an IO professor, which was nice. Uh, but also I chose to take like stats one and stats two in the business school. Um, once I realized I was going to be going to grad school just to kind of get myself more up to speed with how to do a lot of the different statistics. Um, cause psych stats was like very, very basic. Like I think the max we got to was like correlation oh, wow. and that was it. I don't even think we talked about regression in that class. So it was nice to take other classes and try to learn more, but very difficult because there was a lot more handwork and less applied thought with doing that. So it was a different challenge. Now, in the in the classes you take now, or I guess transitioning from your undergrad to the program you're in, did you always want to go for that PhD? Because um, it is, at least in my eyes, it was like it was a little frightening. I was like, oh, that's like a lot of extra work, and it was like it feel like the workload was a lot more. Um, but did you just start the master's and then you went into the PhD or is like the PhD all at once? 
Yeah, so DePaul's is a PhD, like, all at once. Like, you apply with the thought that you're going to do it all of it. Um, I did apply for a couple of master's programs. I'm from Minnesota, so I actually applied for, like, Mankato State's program. Um, but I also applied for San Diego State and George Mason um, as backup plans in case if I didn't get into a PhD program. Uh, but I did want to go for the PhD just because um, I just – like I'm a first gen and it was like something that was important to me and like a goal that I had set like junior year that I was like, I can do this and it's going to be free. So I might as well like push through and like make sure I get like the most out of the program if I know that that's my end goal anyway. So um, yeah, that, that was kind of why I decided to go for the PhD instead of doing the master's. And luckily I was able to get in to a couple of programs. So. so, well, congrats first on getting into a bunch of those programs. Uh <laughs> With that, you, you mentioned, you said junior year, you kind of thought that. Um, did you always think it was IO or did you kind of have that epiphany junior year? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, I was kind of lucky to go to an undergrad that had an IO program um, and USF like has a great IO program actually. And so I started joining um, an IO research lab sophomore year. Uh, so I feel like that's when I kind of realized I wanted to go into IO and then I started talking to like the grad students in that program and starting to think about like, did I want to go master's or PhD? And then junior year is when I decided, um, that I wanted to go the PhD route. I didn't, I didn't understand that that meant that it was an undergrad IO program. I thought that, I thought that was a master's that like they allowed you to take their IO courses. That's, that's awesome. Oh no, they, yeah, they have a, a, PhD program there. Um, they, I think they just added a master's recently, and then they do have some IO classes for undergrads. So that's nice. Wow, that's awesome. I wish I had that at my. I went to Binghamton, and the, I heard of IO when I was applying to grad schools. <laughs> Would have been nice, you know, a year before. <laughs> um, but so I know you said you, you did some research um, in your in your lab in undergrad. Now kind of in the PhD program, do you still enjoy that research aspect and see yourself doing that in the future? Or are you planning to do a bit more of applied or maybe even a bit of both? Yeah, I still like doing research. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I actually did like an independent honors thesis program where I did my own um, IO research where I studied LGBT student leaders. So that was really cool. Um, and that's what kind of led me to the PhD program being like, okay, I like this, I can do this. Um, might as well try to do it. So uh, now I've worked with um, almost every professor in the IO department doing research. And while I don't like want to go academic, I do like doing research. So I think it would be cool to do like research science. Like I know McKinsey does like a lot of research science in the IO and they have like a great team there that does like science-based consulting. Um, and so they conduct their own research. So ideally doing something like that would be pretty cool. Oh, no, that, that sounds like a great idea. Um, I, there's not, I feel like there's not a ton of people in our program that are more research oriented, where there's yeah. definitely a couple that like expressed interest. I feel, would you say the same, Brandon? I feel like our program is probably more it's applied based. Program. Yeah, it, uh, we have a, we have a very applied program. Uh, they, like we do have a PhD program as well that you can kind of transition to, um, which is really cool. Um, but definitely it's more based off of the, um, like the application of it, not necessarily the research side. It makes me wonder, I wonder around the grad programs around the country, um, if they're more applied or research based, you guys have any like knowledge of that? Like, I wonder if people are getting into a more applied setting. Uh, I know when I was looking around for programs, I had like a list of all of the different schools that had IO programs. And honestly, that list is changing very fast because it's growing a lot. Um, but I would say that when I was looking, a lot more of the programs I saw were like research based. Um, but there was also like the PsyD versus the uh, getting like your PhD and like if you compare and contrast those programs as well, I mean, I, you can tell me what you saw, Laura, but I saw a lot more um, research-based programs. Yeah, I would say at the master's level, I feel like a lot of them do implement research. I know like San Diego State, uh, George Mason, San Francisco State, like those ones that I thought about applying to all had research components or like the option to do a thesis. Um, I think 
if the school is offering an option to do the thesis, that's usually like a pretty good indicator that they do research there or at least have the capability to. Um, so any schools that don't offer that probably don't really have the capability to do research, you know? So um, like Mankato State was definitely very applied, like a year and a half long program in and out. For, for us, I think our, our program, you can do a master's thesis or um, they like require one or the other, or we have to do an internship. Um, is that something, is that similar for your program? Because I see that you've had internships. Is that where just like something on your own accord or like the, the program kind of like enforce that? Yeah, that's definitely on our own accord. Um, our stipend is pretty low. So I was definitely motivated to look for an internship for money reasons, um, but also for experience since I know I want to go applied. Um, but our thesis is required and uh, they definitely expect that we focus on our thesis more than we focus on getting internships. Were they able to like help or assist you with the internships? Um, or was that just like you going on whatever it is, Handshake LinkedIn or any other website? Yeah, so they do forward um, like opportunities from alumni or sometimes we have like local Chicago area organizations that will let like our director know if there's different things that they're looking for and they want an IO person for it. Um, but I would say for me, uh, it was definitely a very long and very uh, tough process to find either of my internships um, and neither of them I got because of my program. I just got them from doing my own application process. So. Yeah, but I know some people have gotten internships using like alumni connections. Oh, okay, I know it. it's tough. <laughs> Brandon and I and our cohort are going through that process now. <laughs> yeah, we're we are we are in the process right now of doing those applications because we have to have one by next year. Uh, oh. But uh, talking about your internship, just wondering. Um, I know that you're doing like that organizational development intern, correct? Yeah. So with that, um, is that like kind of the area in IO that you want to look at? Or are you just kind of testing the waters and seeing what you like? Yeah, so my first internship was in leadership development um, at Ford. And then this time I'm doing organizational development at CME Group. Um, and I've liked both for different reasons. I really kind of like that development aspect of both of the internships. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to pursue like training and development as like a specific niche, I think I want to try to stay a little bit more broad, um, which is why I'm kind of interested into going to like consulting. Uh, but I would still want to keep doing like development type work just because I think it's like a good blend of the I and the O uh, versus like assessment, you know, is like very I or like if you just do occupational health, it's like very O. So I think it's kind of a nice blend in the development space. No, yeah, it definitely makes sense. I, uh, the, the internships that everyone we're looking at are more where I know that there's a couple that are organizational development, um, consulting, like those are like the big picture ones that people want in our program. And I think for the same reasons, they like to get that broad overview of like what they can do. Um, so hopefully, you know, we find some internships yeah. next, <laughs> next semester <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, yeah, it took me like 200 and like 30 applications to get my first one, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, so don't, don't you fret apply, yet. Apply. <laughs> it will come, hopefully. Um, you know, um, for our um, listeners out there, for those prospective students, I guess, could you kind of paint a picture of that application process? Because I know you're saying how tedious it is for you and how much you had to do, like what, what did that look like for you and how long, like how long did that process take? Yeah. Um, my first year was definitely more difficult than my second year since I didn't have any experience in IO yet. Um, I started looking in like October of my first year um, and started applying and didn't get an internship until April. Uh, so it was definitely a very long uh, process and pretty disheartening at times too, because I received like, probably 150 rejections. So uh, how I went about it was um, I had saved searches on LinkedIn for like, I want to say 15 or 16 different titles uh, with like the search for intern. Um, and I made a graphic actually that I can send you that's on my LinkedIn uh, that has all of those titles listed. So hopefully that could be helpful to someone. Um, 
and then yeah just kind of just trying to get those numbers up because I figured it was a numbers game and then uh trying to reach out to people at places that I saw that were looking for IOs that had IOs um, and trying to set up informational interviews with people to just get to know them. And hopefully if it like resulted in a referral, then great. Most of the time it didn't uh, just because they didn't really feel like they had the capability to give a referral. So um, yeah, I would say mostly just keeping the search, applying every week to ones you see, don't wait too long to apply. Um, and trying not to to get upset when you get those rejection emails because like a lot of times it's just like a match between what your resume says and the tr the like resume screener that they're using. So I, I totally agree. One thing that helped is I had like an Excel doc and I put like the name, the link, and the any other extra information. But I had a column that says like answer yes or no and just putting no <laughs> no over and over again i was like oh geez <laughs> it was tough yeah i use notion to track mine and, and same it was hard seeing all the red nose yeah uh, however if you're in a master's program and you you know apply 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 um for anyone out there who's having trouble you'll get something soon hopefully <laughs> um but the fun thing about being an IO um, student is the Bay Conference, SIOP. Have you ever attended or do you plan to go to the one in Boston this um, upcoming April? Yeah, I've attended twice. I went to the New Orleans one virtually like everyone else. Um, and then last year, the one in uh, Seattle was really fun. That was my first one in person. Um, and I will be going to Boston. And it's my first time presenting. So that's exciting. Oh, congrats. That's awesome. Thanks. Can you give us a little, uh, some, maybe not tips, but maybe just like what to expect this. So this will be Brandon and I's first one. Um, and I know a lot of other people that listen to this podcast first one too. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think the things that helped me the most were trying to look ahead at the schedule and planning out for what you wanted to go to. Um, but also realizing that you really can't go to more than like three or four things in a day. Um, my first day there, I did try to do more and I felt like I was just constantly running from one thing to another and it was just way too much. Um, but also like trying to say yes to as many things as you can. So, uh, for example, if you haven't done the mentorship program that they offer, I think it's called like the ambassador program. Um, do it, try it. It was nice to have a um, person to meet up with and like talk to and grab coffee with. Uh, and they also gave me like a lot of really good advice. Um, going to the grad student happy hours is a great way to meet people. Um, I had like a little QR code that I had on my phone screen that connected to my LinkedIn so that people could, if I met someone and I was like getting along with them, well, I could just have them scan my phone and add me on LinkedIn. So that was a great way to connect with people. Um, and then if your school like has any connections to uh, like alumni that you know that you'd like to talk to, see if they're going to PSYOP and try to set up like a coffee or a lunch with them would be a great way to um, expand your network and then also just connect with people that maybe you wouldn't normally have the chance to. That sounds great. I like the QR code idea. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to hold up like a poster. Yes. A lot of people were like, wow, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Joe and I are probably thinking the same thing. <laughs> we'll do that, but we'll do for the podcast and we'll just have, you know, like a big, both of our faces. Exactly. <laughs> Please listen. <laughs> um, no, that, that, it, that's great. It's great advice though. It's good to hear. No. Yeah. Um, that is awesome. Um, and to add to that, I guess like we, we don't want to take up too much of your day. Um, but with that, like what is some advice that you have out there for those students trying to enter the IO field? Who are really looking to uh, get involved with IO early on, and what can you tell them from your experience? I think that I said yes too much at first, to the point where I had to say no later. Um, which, by that, I mean I started doing everything. Uh, I joined all the clubs. I joined all of the different. IO discords, the IO Reddit, like I made an academic Twitter, I joined a committee for, through PSYOP, like I did IO Coffee House when that was a thing. Um, and then eventually I was like, wow, this is way too much. And I had to just kind of start dropping things. 
Um, so I think while trying to find what works for you is really great, uh, being a little bit more specific and a little more intentional in how you spend your time will probably be a better use of your time than just saying like yes to every single thing. Uh, so trying to think ahead about like what will serve you for your career uh, in the long term and the kind of network that you want to build versus like so like quality over quantity kind of um, and just like trying to be really yeah intentional in, in what you choose to spend your time on because you only have so much time. Um, yeah, I would say I learned that the hard way. So maybe just thinking ahead so that you don't no one else has to learn it the hard way, too. It makes total sense. I uh you feel like when you come to the program, especially from a lot of people who might have not heard of IO, you're like, oh, I could do this. I could do this. I could put this on my resume. I could add this experience. And you kind of just try to grab everything all at once, um, which I think is good in some sense. Maybe not the too much part of it, but get gathering that experience. Um, but once you burn out, you burn out for a little bit and it, it can impact like everything else you do. Uh, so I definitely agree. I know. Brandon and I were actually just talking about this uh, right before the podcast started. Um, we're like, I don't know if we can do this competition coming up because everything else is just starting to pile on. Um, so no, it is, it's, it's, it is great advice. hundred percent. No, that, that is fantastic advice. And Joe's right. We were literally just talking about this um, and, and don't get that confused because Laura is right. Like you want to take every opportunity that you can, but you want to be like meticulous with the opportunities and not just like, always saying yes. Like, I think that's such great advice, especially for Joe and I who are entering our second semester right now. We're, we're kind of feeling that. <laughs> so that, that's, that's awesome. But yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us today, today, Laura. It was great hearing you talk and just talk about your program. Um, if anyone's in the Chicago area, I would definitely look into DePaul, <laughs> uh, ask Laura about any questions, additional questions that you might have. Uh, but yeah, thanks again for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me, John Brandon. It was great talking with you today. All right. So that was great having Laura on. Um, I feel like she really did a good job at painting a picture of what the DePaul master's and PhD program looks like. You know, Joe, like, I think it's really interesting when you and I were applying to these programs and looking around, there wasn't as much exposure out there for all these other IO programs. I feel like now there's a lot more ways to find out being in the field but being somebody who's like coming from the outside, it's definitely a lot tougher to find out this information. Like I, I looked up a lot of programs. I searched online like meticulously to try and find master's programs. And I never even saw one from DePaul. Like, did, have, how about you? What did you see? No, you're right. I haven't seen a lot of like IO information at undergrads. And I, it wasn't until, honestly, I applied at Binghamton. And then it was the following couple months that I think it was actually Hofstra that came and did like a, a talk about their IO program. I was like, Oh, why couldn't they have this, you know, a year ago <laughs> would have saved me some extra time. Um, but honestly growing, I feel like there are, as we kind of go on, like in the next couple of years, we're going to see some more IO program stuff. And I feel like the other students that we've had on have said that they've seen more IO things out in the country. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. And I, and I would say too, like for those students out there who are trying to find their way into the field, the best thing that like Joe and I can advise you to do is surround yourselves with people in the field, like reaching out to people online and seeing where they went to school or just seeing who they know. Because uh, I know for me, uh, I joined IO a little bit later, as did Joe. Um, so we didn't have that exposure. And now we're in conversation with these people every day. So we're seeing all these things that we would have seen earlier on if we had if we had that exposure early on. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, a hundred percent. Just talk to as many people as you can, even if you're like a sophomore or a junior in in your undergrad, and you you know you still don't really know what you want to do. Create a LinkedIn, put a couple things on there, and just message someone that's in an IO program or any other type of programs that you want to apply, and just say like, oh, what do you you know what's your day to day like? It doesn't have to be you know an opportunity grab or anything like that. Just, just some 15 minutes of some information can really like kind of change your life. No. Yeah. hundred percent. Joe is right. Like any information is good information at this point, especially when you're still trying to find your way in. Um, but we want to thank you guys so much for listening. If you have any questions for Laura about her program, her LinkedIn is going to be in the bio. 
And uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.